good. So what I'm going to talk about today are exercise and nutritional therapies that uh, we have uh, found helpful and uh, some uh, strategies for the future of the things that we'd like to do for FSH muscular dystrophy. Um, I'm a professor in pediatrics and uh, adult medicine. Uh, I've spent my whole life working in the area of neuromuscular and neurometabolic diseases. From a disclosure perspective, these are some of the companies I've consulted for, um, but the main disclosure, uh, which is our company, which is really spun out of um, the research that we've done. Uh, the main focus is to um, improve uh, the health of people who have aging associated muscle loss um, and also those who have obesity and its complications, especially fatty liver disease. Um, there are uh, potential, and you'll see, um, applications to muscular dystrophy and um, mitochondrial disease as well. Um, for those individuals, uh, we give them a discount code so that we don't make any money to avoid conflict of interest. Uh, and we can certainly give the Canadians uh, the discount code, as all my patients have, if they do wish to purchase our stuff. But of course, we show people how to buy uh, these things at Costco um, uh, to try and put things together. Uh, for themselves uh, without buying it through our company. Um, so what have I done in my whole uh, career? Uh, I'll summarize it in this one slide so you kind of know where we're coming from. Uh, we're very mitochondrial centric and um, much of my basic science work has been in the area of mitochondrial function. And you'll see how that's relevant to FSH dystrophy in just a minute. We've spent a lot of time over the years working with the kinesiology department, trying to understand the basic physiology behind why muscles hypertrophy. So how can we use different types of nutritional interventions, exercise to get muscles to hypertrophy to improve strength? And the flip side is how do we get muscles to have better endurance and that's to improve mitochondria. And the reason we've um, been interested in studying athletes and young people who are doing training and older adults who are exercising is so we could apply it to the diseases I see in the clinic. So the main group that we see are patients with genetic mitochondrial disorders mitochondrial disorders um, uh, as well as muscular dystrophies. The main muscular dystrophies that we see in the clinic are myotonic dystrophy type one, type two, FSH dystrophy and sporadic IBM. Uh, statistically, those are the more common, but of course we see many children with uh, Duchenne and we see many children and adults with limb girdle as well. But in addition to the disorders that we see, what's interesting is that of course with the primary genetic mitochondrial disease, there's damage to this powerhouse of our cell called the mitochondria, which I'll talk about more in a minute. But we see that also in muscular dystrophy, uh, especially in FSH, but also common disorders like obesity and sarcopenia of aging. So we've learned an awful lot about the basic science and our company's trying to apply this to sarcopenia and obesity because they are very common uh, issues in society. So as mentioned, we think the mitochondria is involved in so many disorders, and you'll see why in uh, just a minute. So the mitochondria is the powerhouse of our cell, and it takes the food that we eat and the oxygen that we breathe, and it converts it into energy. When it's not working properly, there's a variety of biochemical processes that happen which are relevant to muscle disorders. One is called apoptosis, which is pre-programmed cell death, and especially nerves undergo pre-programmed cell death, muscles undergo apoptosis, as well as something called necrosis. When there's damage to muscle, there's an activation of inflammation through what's called the inflammasome. And in FSH dystrophy in particular, uh, certainly the group in Denmark has uh, used MRI to show that there's this big increase that they see in inflammation before muscles really start to shrink. And we think it's all tied up in a vicious cycle that happens with mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, oxidative stress, inflammation, which can feed off of each other. And that's why for some of you, you may notice that a muscle that was pretty good last year will uh, pretty rapidly decline in function. And so our goal uh, is to try and mitigate that and prevent it before it happens. When mitochondria don't work properly, there's also an increase in what's called free radicals or oxygen stress. And that's particularly relevant in FSH dystrophy. Uh, about 20 years ago, I reviewed some very interesting data coming out of France, where in a Petri dish, uh, muscle cells, uh, which uh, are single cells, but as they start to differentiate, they have to come together. And what happened is with oxidative stress and FSH cells, the cells couldn't come together and fuse to form mature muscle. But when they added antioxidants, uh, it allowed the muscle cells to fuse better. Uh, and it's uh, likely, as I'll show you in a minute, the toxic expression of duct spore leading to oxidative stress, inflammation, and mitochondrial dysfunction, which impairs the cell's ability to fuse. 
Other things can happen. I won't get too much into it, but there's something called cell senescence, where essentially the cells uh, stop replicating. Uh, damage to the DNA, both mitochondrial and, uh, DNA and the nuclear DNA. And an interesting thing that happens with aging, some of you might be familiar with telomeres, which are the caps on the end of our chromosomes. And as they shorten, it causes the cell to essentially stop working. The other thing that uh, one of my colleagues, Stu Phillips, and I'll mention his name again later, uh, has found with aging, and uh, this has been reported as well with various types of muscular dystrophy, as you can well expect, a reduction in protein synthesis. So you're just not making as much muscle, so the muscles eventually start to shrink. And uh, we're very interested in aging uh, because uh, we can study all sorts of you know, cool uh, interventions that we can then apply to our patients with muscular dystrophy because it's so common. And as you see here by the year 2025, in many states in the US, uh, over 20% uh, of the population will be over the age of 65. So if we don't start thinking about aging and thinking about muscle mass loss, it's gonna have a huge impact on society. But of course, everything that we learn and apply to aging, uh, we think is very relevant to muscular dystrophy. So what's the first thing that uh, is beneficial uh, in aging? Uh, and that is exercise. So it's very clear based on innumerable studies that people who do uh, habitual exercise get improvements in their overall health. On average, if people exercise um, uh, about 30 minutes a day, five days a week, uh, which isn't too much uh, of your time, you will get a four year lifespan extension uh, and you will compress aging. So most people as they age the last 10 years is a slow decline into disability. Uh, but with exercise, you not only get four years lifespan extension, you compress aging. And you can see here, if we plot the number of hours of vigorous activity versus a variety of common disorders, you can see that the risk of these things goes down substantially. And you can see even three hours of exercise per week, you get a big reduction in things like diabetes, hip fractures, cardiovascular disease, and as I mentioned, all-cause mortality, which is death. So in older adults, uh, we and others have published many, many studies showing that uh, it is safe and it is possible to improve function. And we've even seen this in folks up to 92 years of age, where studies have shown that you can safely increase strength, functional capacity, which is your ability to go up and down stairs, get out of a chair, which is very relevant for our MD patients, and improve muscle mass and improve the mitochondria. Interestingly, there are some people, um, you know, even 20 years ago, uh, even 10 years ago, were saying you're going to damage muscle, it's going to be worse off, you're going to have this oxidative stress, you're going to have more inflammation. But that's not the case. If done properly, these actually go down because you build up proteins which help to protect the muscle. <clears throat> so what we know uh, with uh, human aging, and this is uh, our knee extension, which is your kicking strength on a fancy machine we have called a Biodex. And we've studied about 10,000 people in this machine, and I'm gonna explain why this is important. What it really shows here is that a small improvement in function can have a big impact over the long term. So with uh, older adults, we do get a reduction in our knee extension strength as we get older, and that's normal. Uh, we can partially reverse that or prevent that and slow it down when we do regular exercise. In patients with muscular dystrophy, depending on the time when we see them, the type of dystrophy and the severity, we generally have a reduction in knee extension strength. And the reason why that's important is we've uh, again uh, shown that uh, in, in many thousands of patients, when your knee extension strength gets below about 30 Newton meters, 50% of our patients need a cane. When it goes below 20 Newton meters, 50% need a walker. And when it gets below 10 Newton meters, 50% need a wheelchair. So if you're sedentary, um, as I'll show you in a minute, there is a more rapid decline and you cross these disability thresholds sooner. Even a mild improvement in exercise, even if you stop, uh, so if you start exercising, get a boost and then you stop, you're still gonna be better off in the long term. So small changes, as you can see here, really start to shift that curve forward and keep you out of a wheelchair, out of a walker uh, for a longer period of time. As you'll see in a minute with uh, patients who do consistent exercise, we get a significant attenuation of the rate of decline over time. And why that's important, if we can keep people out of these disability thresholds, we can keep them functional and moving uh, uh, longer and keep people from needing institutionalization, chair lifts and various other things. 
So does this have any relevance for muscular dystrophy patients? This is the first study that we did with my now genetic counselor, Lauren Brady, uh, who did her master's with me. And we looked at patients with myotonic dystrophy type one, and uh, we had patients who exercised consistently. We had uh, patients who uh, didn't listen to me and didn't exercise. You can see that their uh, age was very similar. And then we had patients who weren't exercising, who listened to us and started exercising, and those who were exercising and stopped. This latter group is particularly relevant for the um, people who've experienced the uh, shutdowns from COVID-19. And we have a paper coming out where we have 100 patients, 50 of whom maintained their exercise and 50 of whom stopped because of COVID. And you can see that those who stopped dropped significantly, which you'd pretty much predict from uh, this paper here. And what we found here, oops, sorry, that went in reverse. Uh, uh, the patients who exercise had better knee strength arm strength and grip strength versus those who were sedentary. So it shows that people are starting at a higher level. And again, these are not less severe patients. They had the same severity score, which is based on a thing called CTG repeats. Then we looked at those folks who started exercise. Now, again, it was a fairly small number, but we actually got a significant increase in kicking strength. And those who stopped exercise, uh, we had a decrease. It wasn't quite statistically significant. Now, we've now replicated that, uh, no thanks to COVID, with a much larger group clearly showing that those who have been exercising who stop um, will show more of a decline uh, versus those who maintain their exercise. So what about FSH specifically? Um, the Probably the best study is my friend and colleague, um, Dr. John Vissing, uh, who's in Denmark, and they did a study on 41 men and women with FSH dystrophy, and they had three groups. Uh, one group, they did 12 weeks of exercise training uh, three times a week at 30 minutes, which is very similar to what we've used in many of our studies. We think that's a good uh, uh, sort of a minimum level to shoot for. And what they did in one arm, and I'll talk more about this later, is they gave them whey protein, which is uh, one of the components of milk, which stimulates protein synthesis and some carbohydrates to replenish uh, glycogen stores versus a placebo. So a pretty small amount of protein. Um, and didn't change their total protein intake, but they did get a little bit more post-exercise versus a control group. And what it shows clearly is the individuals who did not exercise, which are control groups here, there's either no improvement in uh, walking speed, uh, in your maximum ability to pedal a bike, um, or what's called your VO2 max. So it actually went down a little bit here. And what you can see is that exercise was the main effect so your VO2 max, again, going up about 11%, your total power output going up about 24%, and your walking speed going up about 6%. There was a trend, but not a significant increase in those who took the uh, whey protein versus placebo. You can see all these numbers are a little bit better, but it didn't reach statistical significance. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So we've just published a study uh, looking at myotonic muscular dystrophy uh, a little bit more at the biochemical level to see uh, with muscle biopsies what's going on. And this was published in uh, a journal called JCI recently. Uh, so myotonic dystrophy, you might say, well, what relevance does that have to us? It's actually very similar at the cellular level. And I'll show you that in just a minute. So this is a disorder due to a trinucleotide repeat leading to muscle weakness. And in fact, a number of our patients, when you look at them, uh, they will actually have an FSH pattern of weakness with the periscapular weakness as well. And they're almost indistinguishable. Uh, the big difference is the hand grip is uh, weaker in myotonic uh, dystrophy. And so what we did is we had 11 patients and we matched them to sedentary, healthy individuals. And we took our patients through three months of cycling three times per week at a fairly moderate in, uh, intensity. So they could still you know, talk and converse with us uh, while they're listening to music and cycling. And we did it for 35 minutes. Now, again, don't freak out over the science here. I'm just going to show you that like aging, like FSH dystrophy, like sporadic inclusion body myopathy, there is a reduction in the powerhouse of our cell called the mitochondria. And therefore, that explains a lot of the consequences that we see. So this is what's called a Western blot. This is the total amount of protein of the mitochondria, showing that it is lower in our patients. But look at this. There's a significant improvement, an increase in the uh, mitochondrial protein with exercise. And that's depicted here, lower uh, in our patients going back after just three months of exercise across the board for all the mitochondrial proteins. This is another way of looking at it. This is a muscle biopsy cross-section showing good 
normal um, mitochondria, severe reduction in our myotonic patients, but uh, quite a significant restoration after exercise training. And this is just another fancy way of looking at it in live cells that we take out of the biopsy. Importantly, however, it was very safe. In fact, the, his, oops, the histology actually looked better. There was less fibrosis. CK did not go up. Uh, no cardiac, oh my goodness, sorry about that. No cardiac issues, uh, no joint pain. And what we found was the six minute walk test went up by 47 meters. Uh, timed up and go and sit to stand went up. And these are all outcome metrics that uh, when you're doing a clinical trial, uh, for example, uh, the US FDA and Health Canada look at the six minute walk test and expensive drugs like myozyme for pompe disease was approved based on a 27 meter uh, increase and it cost a million bucks a year per patient. Think about that. Think how many gym memberships you could give or good quality protein. Uh, there was a 30% increase in their maximal oxygen consumption and 1.6 kilo increase in their muscle mass. Now, what we did is when we saw this, and I was um, going to be giving a talk at the Solve um, FSH uh, dystrophy meeting in Whistler earlier this year. So I tasked my research coordinator, Erin, to go back and find me the first uh, 10 patients she could find who had FSH who exercised consistently where we had data for 10 years or more and then uh, grab me the next 10 people who did no exercise for 10 years or more, and uh, let's take a look at their data. So uh, we're working on publishing this right now. We're putting many more people into it, uh, but you can see here, this is our kicking strength. That's the knee extension. That's what it looks like. That's our fancy machine here, which measures this, and it's incredibly accurate. What we found is that the first 10 people that we could find who exercise consistently at a 3% drop over this time period versus those who didn't, who had a 34% drop. So you would think that exercise is not medicine. If a drug did this, I would be a billionaire right now. There's no drug in the world that's been shown to have this kind of a magnitude of effect in any muscle disease whatsoever. And given that your knee strength, as I showed you before, is really important for function, so too is your arm strength. And as you know, with FSH, the biceps can be affected. Um, even if your shoulder, um, is taken out of the equation and you just lift the biceps up, it can be affected. And why that's important, it makes it harder to brush your teeth and comb your hair. So if we look at the arm strength here, you can see Kristen doing it here, a 4% drop in the regular exercisers, but a 38% drop in those who are sedentary. So it shows the robustness um, and the, the benefits. Now, keep in mind that we do counsel, as I'll show you in a minute, that our patients take creatine and antioxidants, but in this group, both patients were taking these as well. So it shows that over and above the potential benefits from that, exercise is good. So when we look at our different disorders that we see, um, you know, because aging is so common, we and others have excellent evidence that there's improvements in many metrics, including quality of life, um, increase in muscle and less body fat, and at the cellular level, all sorts of goodies. We and others have done quite a bit of work in mitochondrial disease uh, showing these benefits, but there's very little in FSH. Um, and certainly body composition is a real unknown. And I'll show you, it's a big problem. We've added to the literature in myotonic dystrophy, which at the cellular level has a lot of similarities. So we think that there's gonna be some spillover. And again, um, we have very little evidence in uh, SIBM um, other than we and others have shown improvements with strength training. So what about nutrition? We'll uh, do the last half of this talk on nutrition. So this is an older study that we published years ago where we looked at the dietary habits of people with muscular dystrophy. And you can see that we had FSH patients. Um, um, I think in this, we had 16 patients and we did dietary records. So we had people record everything that they ate over uh, two weekdays and a weekend day. And then we repeated that. Jesus is twitchy. Again, five months later. And then what we did is we compared it to the Canadian and US uh, RDA. So what you see here is this a, is the proportion of people who on their daily diet were not meeting even the basal requirements for the US RDA or the Canadian dietary reference intake. So you can see that 68% of patients were not getting enough energy. And why that's important is that we need food to come in to give us the energy to move. The problem with many of our patients is because of their weakness, they don't move as much and therefore they don't take in as many calories. The consequences of that is many vitamins and minerals are low. And you can see here that uh, even for a sedentary person who doesn't have muscular dystrophy, 
uh, these levels of intake are going to lead to suboptimal vitamin and mineral intake. Other things to think about here that are important is for a sedentary person, protein requirements, uh, you're still 16% weren't meeting it. However, when we look at the protein that's required for muscular dystrophy, which is about 50% greater, about 70% were not meeting that protein intake. Body mass index, um, about 18% were obese by BMI and nine were underweight by BMI. And I'll show you why this BMI is, is garbage and there's other ways we need to measure body composition. So what does this mean? What we've done um, is actually taken a look at a variety of our different patients. Um, and it's the same for every type of muscular dystrophy, uh, myotonic. We've looked at um, 1,500 patients measuring uh, serum vitamin levels. And what you can see, depending on the vitamin, I'll just highlight some big ones here. This is vitamin B12, about 14% of our patients are insufficient. And vitamin D, this is really important because low vitamin D intake ultimately can predispose to osteoporosis. But we also know that very low vitamin D in this range, and this is severely deficient patients, uh, you know, 10 to 12% of our population, at this level, you not only can predispose to getting osteoporosis, but also muscle weakness. And with the current guidelines for vitamin D, uh, we found that 85% of our patients aren't meeting the current recommendations for vitamin D. And uh, we're working on this publication, but we think this is an important point to get across that most people are insufficient. So what do we do about it? Well, we know that um, energy intake is low in many of our patients, probably because they're not moving as much. Because of that, it pulls down vitamins and minerals. You don't get as many. Um, and then uh, some people may be, uh, it's not just that they're not moving as much, food preparation or eating can be difficult. FSH, not so much compared to IBM, mitochondrial disease, or um, myotonic, but some patients can have swallowing issues, which can lead to some issues. If anyone does have dysphagia, we recommend a swallowing um, study. Based on our um, study showing that most of the multivitamins, people are not getting enough in their diet, we'd recommend taking a balanced multivitamin. We do recommend checking for deficiencies. The big ones are folic acid, vitamin B12, vitamin D. And in males, uh, we check also for low testosterone and bring that back to normal, assuming they don't have prostate cancer. And keep in mind as a clinician, a deterioration in function could be a vitamin deficiency. Severely low vitamin D. We have patients coming in with high CK, muscle weakness and fatigue, um, and all they have is low vitamin D. We replace it and they go back to normal. So if an able-bodied person can have deficiencies in vitamin D causing myopathy, think what that would do to a patient with muscular dystrophy. In general, um, our general sort of suggestion for all myopathies is identify and treat vitamin deficiencies. And we've talked about this. Um, when patients have low muscle mass, uh, you are more prone to type 2 diabetes. So make sure that's checked every year. Uh, things like hypothyroidism are fairly common in the general population and uh, plays havoc with muscle. So uh, even mild hypothyroidism causes mitochondrial dysfunction, high CK and muscle weakness, and it's easy to treat this. Uh, for our patients, we always assess um, and uh, recommend uh, gait assistive devices if they are necessary to avoid falls. In FSH in particular, with the dorsiflexion weakness, we usually start with what's called an ankle support orthotic, which helps to keep the foot up and keep you from going over in your ankle. Uh, but if the foot drop is really bad, we recommend an AFO, which can really improve gait and decrease fall risk. The other thing that's important is a sleep study, not just obstructive sleep apnea, but a small fraction of our FSH patients do get a restrictive ventilatory defect and may need BiPAP. This is important too, adequate protein. So all of our patients, uh, we put them on 50% more protein than the uh, daily recommended intake. Uh, work by Birch Griggs and others have shown that uh, patients have um, reduction in protein synthesis and optimal protein can help to bring uh, that um, problem uh, back up to normal. So what about some specific things that we and others have looked at? One is creatine. You might have heard of this from the sports community because a lot of patients were taking, or patients, uh, athletes were taking it to improve their function. But uh, my first grad student, Johnny Parisi, um, who technically I guess is my boss, he's the associate dean of science. Uh, we published a paper back in 1999 where we did muscle biopsies from patients with a variety of disorders. And in our muscular dystrophy patients, including FSH, we showed that there was very significant reduction in creatine. <clears throat> creatine is very important in our body. We get it by eating fish and meat, 
So if you're not a meat or fish eater, you're getting zero coming in and your muscle levels will be even lower. Your liver does produce some, but it can't make up for the lack of endogenous intake. Uh, and that's the reason why, as you'll see in a minute, we recommended creatine supplementation for our patients. It goes into muscle. Most of our creatine is in muscle, and it's um, eventually excreted as creatinine through the kidneys. And why it's important potentially is um, we and others have shown in older adults and young athletes that we can increase muscle mass. It, it leads to an increase in strength and power, only about 1%, uh, 2% for uh, athletes. But when you train with it, when you're strength training, uh, there can be 20, 30% greater improvement with creatine versus placebo. Uh, and it improves high intensity power output. It also is an antioxidant and it's been shown to improve mitochondrial function. So this is the first study in FSH specific uh, patients uh, from my colleague Maggie Walter in Germany. Um, so they had 36 MD patients. It was a randomized trial. And if something is not randomized and double blind, don't believe it uh, for a clinical intervention. Uh, eight weeks of therapy, so it's pretty sure it was only two months. Uh, 12 of the patients had FSH. Uh, the adults were on 10 grams of creatine. Um, my feeling is now that's probably too high. We recommend three to five grams. But nevertheless, they did show an increase in what's called the MRC sum score, which is you know what you've all had with your neurologist where they check your strength and they grade it from zero to five. And the symptom score uh, also was better with the creatine um, folks um, versus placebo. So we have published a paper um, as well with Duchenne dystrophy uh, boys. And uh, then there's a thing called a Cochrane review uh, where all of the studies in the world, including that one I just showed you, are all put together so we can get a better uh, understanding as to whether something's working or not. And this is called a meta-analysis. So this is 192 patients from across the world, Belgium, uh, France, uh, Germany, ourselves in the United States on average uh, there's about an 8.5% increase in strength and a 6.3 uh, kilo increase in muscle mass. Now, some of you may be underwhelmed by an 8.5% increase, but remember that disability threshold. And also keep in mind that boys with Duchenne dystrophy, we poison them, break their bones, give them cataracts, make them obese, give them diabetes, or a 6% increase in strength with corticosteroids. So that's the average uh, improvement favoring creatine over placebo across uh, all of the world literature. So we've done a number of uh, work at a company that I mentioned before in Disclosure um, uh, called Exerkine and our nutrition division is Stay Above Nutrition. And we've been doing 35 years of research in patients with muscle disease and patients with uh, aging. We've published a number of these over the years. Um, and what uh, one of my colleagues came up with, this is um, my uh, first postdoc, Stu Phillips, who's arguably the world's expert in protein metabolism. And as I mentioned before, Johnny Parisi, my first grad student um, that I had. So they came up with a combination, which we were working on, but the little buggers beat us to the punch and actually did a randomized double blind study in older adults where they put together um, everything that we had learned over decades uh, in a multi-ingredient supplement in older adults and compared it to something you probably have heard called collagen. So um, essentially, um, uh, collagen protein is all the rage right now. And um, you see all sorts of advertisements for it, you know, $45 for a tiny little container. Um, and so we said, okay, let's go head to head against collagen um, in this study, which is what Stu did as well in his study and showed benefits to older adults. Um, but let's compare it to what we now call muscle five, which is the uh, combination that Stu and Johnny came up with. We've reformulated this to make it a little more palatable and uh, to drop some of the numbers here. So we have um, creatine, three grams, whey protein. What we changed from Stu's study is we added in a milk-based protein, which has casein. And the reason for that is casein lowers protein degradation. So we thought for aging and muscular dystrophy, that's important. Uh, there's natural calcium that comes in with the casein, vitamin D, and fish oil. Now, with the um, milk, people say, oh, I can't take this because I'm um, lactose tolerant, intolerant. Uh, however, the amount of lactose here is less than in, um, lactose free milk because the protein is pulled out and the lactose stays behind. So, combined, we call this colloquially muscle five uh, with an omega 3 oil. And what we found here is we gave this to older adults, uh, 16 were on placebos, uh, which is our um, essentially collagen, and uh, 16 were taking the muscle five and omega-3s. And what you can see here is 
Um, there was a slight reduction in body fat. You can see how it drifted up a little bit here, but that was statistically significant. Uh, and importantly, there was an increase in um, muscle mass. So when you look at the ratio here, even what's called appendicular skeletal muscle, which is your arms and your legs or total muscle mass, uh, it uh, was statistically significant. But importantly, function, that's what we really care about. My goodness, this is twitchy. Um, and so the leg press uh, went up significantly for the patients who trained uh, on this supplement, as did hand grip strength, uh, as did knee extension strength. So all of those metrics improved. So let's think then about multi-ingredient supplements for patients. Um, so I mentioned before that all of these disorders um, all have as a final uh, common pathway mitochondrial dysfunction. And we've spent a lot of time looking at nutrition, drugs, and exercise because things like oxidative stress, lower protein synthesis, increased inflammation, and stem cell or satellite cell uh, exhaustion. I won't go into it because we don't have time, but you've probably heard others talking that all of these are part of FSH dystrophy. So that crazy increase in DUX4 expression at the cellular level leads to all of these treatable or targetable um, interventions. So one of our theories and hypotheses is if you target just one of them, it's not gonna be enough. You've gotta target multiple final common pathways or cure the disease, which is a heck of a long way off because we can't deliver gene therapy to muscle very effectively without adenovirus. And even then it, does, it goes to liver mostly uh, and wouldn't correct FSH. So there was a study uh, that said, well, let's see about the oxidative stress. What if we target oxidative stress? Will that actually have a benefit? And this is a study that I think too many people forget about. Um, it's a, a great study based on that basic science I was telling you before that with oxidative stress, this uh, myoblasts don't fuse. So what they did is they had 53 FSH patients. They did a clinical trial for 17 weeks, again, blinded, which all studies have to be, otherwise I don't believe them. And they used a variety of antioxidants, which we won't get into. They looked at oxidative stress markers to um, um, minute walk tests, strength and muscular endurance. What's interesting is that their antioxidants here only reduced one marker of oxidative stress called lipid peroxides, um, but all the other ones, including DNA damage and another lipid marker did not improve. Nevertheless, what they did find was there was no effect on two minute walk test. The MVC, which is your maximal strength, and this uh, um, exercise endurance test, where essentially you put your um, um, knee at 30% of uh, the maximal and you go as long as you can, so that's your endurance. So there was functional improvements and that's what people care about, your muscle strength and your muscle endurance, and it got better with this pretty ineffective antioxidant. So that was interesting, but we've been trying to follow up on this for years and years uh, to no success, um, maybe hopefully, um, solve FSH will we'll see the light and uh, our, our study, which I'm going to talk about, will get funded. And what we're basing some of this on is that if we want to target um, these final common pathways, you can't just have a single antioxidant. We showed that CoQ10, which is a powerful antioxidant mitochondrial enhancer, did nothing on its own. But when we combined creatine, CoQ10, vitamin E, and alpha-lipoic acid in patients with definite mitochondrial disease, and this was a study where people were blinded and they took both the placebo and the active and we measured the outcomes. We showed that they absorbed the CoQ10 and we had a reduction in what's called 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine, which is a measure of um, DNA oxidative stress. Unlike the French paper in FSH patients, they showed no reduction in 8 isoprostanes. We had a significant drop here and we improved mitochondrial function, as you can see with the drop in lactate. So we do believe that multi-ingredient supplements are superior for many reasons, which I don't, I don't have time to get into, to single ingredients. So one of the things that's come across um, over the years in aging is that as we become weaker and our muscles get um, more thin and we don't move as much and you put on body fat, uh, it, people used to think, well, you turn your muscle into fat. Well, yes, in muscular dystrophy, there can be fat cells in there, but the general turn your muscles into fat is that your muscles shrink and you don't move as much and you put on uh, body mass and become obese. And it has all sorts of negative consequences like fatty liver disease, cardiometabolic disease, um, and diabetes. So what we did is we did some scans on our patients because I told you before that it looked like only 10 or 15% of our patients were obese using this BMI. And all BMI is, is really your height and your weight. 
So we have a fancy $200,000 machine, which measures how much bone, muscle, and fat you have. And when we put our patients in, you can see our FSH patients here um, and uh, all of our other disease patients. And we've now got many hundreds of, uh, of lines here. And it's very clear that very few patients by BMI appear to be obese. But when we actually measure body fat for obesity, a large number of our patients actually are obese, but it's being hidden, which is probably no surprise because as muscles shrink and then you, know, you get the fat accumulation, you don't see the fat accumulating in the same sort of a pattern. And most of the fat that's accumulating here is abdominal fat, which is the most metabolically disadvantageous. So we've done some studies uh, looking at this with the, um, I won't get into how we came down to the final seven ingredients, but we did innumerable studies and many millions of dollars. Uh, where we tried multi-ingredient supplements to improve mitochondria based on our mitochondrial core concept. We added in some beetroot, which improves mitochondrial function, and then some uh, natural um, uh, extracts, uh, which have been shown to have beneficial effects um, uh, with, um, um, uh, uh, with uh, weight loss. And so what we did is we feed mice a high fat diet to make them obese or high fat and sugar to make them diabetic as well and we treat them uh, with different things. So um, we actually showed that this was effective in lowering body fat, but one of my uh, colleagues didn't believe me, so we gave it to him blindly. His name's Rick Austin, and you can see that this is the high fat fat pads, and this is uh, on the supplement, and you can see also that if you keep going on high fat um, with placebo versus high fat in this combination, uh, you can see the difference where you essentially go back uh, to normal. There's a fatty liver disease that happens with these animals, and that's almost totally uh, protected. And uh, we've shown that here. So this is fatty liver disease. Um, the ME is actually trim seven, same thing, uh, almost complete reduction. We also showed the huge benefits of exercise on the liver uh, as well as muscle function. And there was an enhancement that if you mix both of them, you had double the benefits. And then I won't get into the cellular stuff, but what we showed again, is it increases mitochondrial uh, gene expression. So this is the high fat diet, and this is on a variety of different metabolic enhancers. Uh, this is the trim seven, uh, very similar to exercise, but even more benefit when you exercise. So we did a clinical trial with this, uh, which um, is uh, just submitted recently. And we had 60 overweight and obese men and women uh, on this supplement. And the primary endpoint was weight loss. What was interesting is we also did uh, what's called the body composition index, which looks at the ratio of muscle to adipose, uh, which is a big issue because we've had many patients who've had bariatric surgery or take these new drugs called GLP-1 receptor agonist, which everyone in the US uh, heard it on the news, all the, or not on the news, on a, every TV station has it, that Ozempic, you probably know those ads, that is a GLP-1 receptor agonist. The problem with those and bariatric surgeries, you lose a huge amount of muscle mass. Uh, but in our study, we lost only body fat with no muscle mass. So these are the patients on the active ingredient. And this group also had a 26% reduction in fatty liver markers. So for FSH, uh, we think, and we've been counseling based on innumerable lines of evidence that they should be taking three to five grams, depending females, smaller individuals, large male, five grams of creatine, children, a lower, uh, sorry, a, a relative dose. Vitamin E, 400 units, coenzyme Q10, 200 milligrams twice a day, alpha lipoic acid, 200 milligrams uh, twice a day. And this is based on the fact that in mitochondrial disease patients, this actually lowered oxidative stress with several markers, whereas the combination that was used in FSH dystrophy in that last study didn't actually lower those markers to the same extent. Uh, and we've also shown, since we've given this to patients for 30 years, that it's very, very safe. And like every supplement, always take it with food the way mother nature intended. We recommend to all of our patients to exercise three times a week for 30 to 40 minutes. And then we have very specific FSH exercises, which we are redoing because it used to be a DVD and we're now uh, putting uh, this up on um, a YouTube channel. Uh, so that should be ready in the next two weeks. So all of you can take a look at that. So we have a grant um, from CIHR for our myotonic patients to study endurance plus resistance exercise to target the specific muscles in that disease, which we also want to do for FSH dystrophy. And uh, essentially, it would be um, the trim seven to try and reduce some of the adiposity and improve mitochondrial function, lower oxidative stress, and reduce inflammation, uh, but at the same time, promote increase in muscle uh, strength. 
And uh, there's some proprietary interesting ideas I have about um, trying to methylate uh, the duct spore region through a variety of different supplements, um, which would be very FSH specific. Uh, we just got to get the money for it. So these are all the folks that have done the work. That's the lab, um, our clinic, uh, local collaborators, international collaborators, and all the folks that have funded the research. Great. So I'll stop there and take some questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I'll, uh, great. Uh, so yes, uh, people can post questions in the Q&A section. Um, so we have a number al already. Uh, here's one. Um, if FSHD and muscular dystrophy in general wastes muscle, why aren't more anabolic agents used in preserving and building muscle mass? Things like testosterone, growth hormone, anavar, oxandrolone. Um, this particular individual says he's been able to build a substantial amount of muscle using these drugs, but it seems very taboo for doctors to suggest. Um, yeah. What is your view on that? Yeah, no, uh, there's, there's tons of research in that area. So uh, that's a very logical thought and uh, great minds at the University of Rochester, which is where I did uh, some of my neurology training, Birch Griggs and others have tried that in myotonic uh, dystrophy type one and in Duchenne dystrophy. Uh, there was an oxandrolone study also uh, from the NIH in Duchenne dystrophy. There is mild benefit from the one study, but it was combined with creatine. So hard to know which one it was, but no benefit in the Rochester group. There have been innumerable studies with insulin-like growth factor type 1, with oxandrolone, with testosterone in uh, older adults, Kevin Yaroshevsky and others at University of Washington, showing surprisingly no benefits if your levels are normal. We have shown in muscular dystrophy, including FSH, uh, that upwards of 50% of our adults have hypogonadism, that is low testosterone. And if, as long as you don't have prostate cancer or prostatic hypertrophy, it makes sense to bring those levels into the normal range. And it's been shown innumerable times in older adults that hypogonadal older adult males, uh, when they are replaced with testosterone, will get far better gains in muscle than those uh, who are unsupplemented. So I agree 100% check. You measure total and free testosterone and uh, consult with a uh, endocrinologist and or a urologist as to whether it's safe to go on it. Again, the side effect is, as you're probably familiar, anyone who has prostatic hypertrophy, they give you uh, testosterone blockers to keep the, uh, the prostate small. The problem with that is you actually shrink your muscle big time. And so, you know, it's a, it's a, a yin and yang phenomenon, but it's better than getting prostate cancer. But for most people, I agree, deficient men for sure, but super compensating it uh, can lead to um, a thing called peliosis of the liver, where you can bleed into the liver, um, uh, reductions in HDL cholesterol, which in increases cardiovascular risk, and uh, likely no benefit if you are normal in your testosterone levels. Right. And you were focusing in your comments on testosterone. What about other anabolic agents? Are they all equal or are there some? Yeah, you know? so, uh, yeah. so Kevin Yaroshevsky, um, you know, has, has, has studied growth hormone. I, I mentioned that and um, uh, IGF. Uh, growth hormone uh, does not increase muscle protein synthesis. Mike Rennie showed that it increases connective tissue and that's why you get the big jaw and all that kind of stuff. So um, it, uh, it would not work at all uh, to begin with. IGF-1, which is a, um, a um, a hormone produced at the liver when uh, growth hormone goes up has more of an anabolic effect. And even that didn't work uh, when uh, Kevin studied it. So um, yeah, it, it intuitively makes a lot of sense, but um, it, it just doesn't work unless you're replacing a deficiency. And in that case, you'd be using testosterone to replace the testosterone. Low testosterone. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. Um, Here's a question. Has anyone looked at the correlation of low vitamin D and COVID in the FSHD population? Well, it's been studied, um, you know, in the broader population. Obviously, there's not enough people um, to do a, pro a proper study, just an FSH who unfortunately got COVID because most people were pretty... Uh, 
uh, pretty re religious about not uh, getting exposed and getting vaccinated and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, low vitamin D is one of the known risk factors. Obesity is a known risk factor. Low vitamin D is a known risk factor. So uh, we are very aggressive about uh, measuring and replacing vitamin D. And we would recommend you should be trying to get it over 75 nanomoles per liter, which is the current uh, Canadian U.S. recommendations for uh, health. Great. Thank you. Uh, could you clarify recommended amounts of creatine for FSHD patients? Um, yeah, like I was saying, yeah, three grams uh, for females um, and for males, five, just because of the muscle mass size differences um, and uh, 100 milligrams per kilogram for children per day. Creatine is a long half-life, so you can either take it breakfast, uh, lunch and supper and divide it out, or you can take it all at once, whatever is convenient. Um, what we find is a lot of people get an aversion to the powder itself. Um, never buy liquid creatine as complete BS. Um, it gets converted to creatinine and is garbage and you're wasting your money. So don't believe the hype. Never buy anything other than creatine monohydrate. All the other salts of creatine, at the end of the day, you still end up with creatine and you're just paying for other uh, garbage, purple K and creatine hydrochloride and all that garbage. Every human study has been done with creatine monohydrate which is the least expensive of all of the forms of creatine and the one that all the studies have been done on to, to show that they do work. Okay. This question, can creatine, assuming it's creatine monohydrate, can it be taken in hot coffee in the morning? <laughs> so. Yeah, so um, that's an excellent question. So what happens is that over time, if creatine is exposed to water, it'll slowly break down into creatinine, which is why any liquid formula is garbage. Um, and so if you put it in, uh, into a liquid, it's fine for probably an hour or two at room temperature. In boiling coffee, if you were to boil it and keep boiling it over about five or 10 minutes, it would convert to creatinine. So what we recommend, um, which I do, I take that muscle fiber which has creatine in it just because I'm getting old. Uh, I put a bit of milk in there um, and then I mix it in and uh, then it, it really shouldn't break down as long as you drink your coffee within 10 to 15 minutes. Um, straight up in coffee too, it'll still sink to the bottom. So spin it around, which is why we usually tell people to put it into pudding or applesauce or yogurt or something like that. Okay, great. It's a question on the role of magnesium. Any thoughts about? Yeah, we use magnesium, magnesium a lot for cramps. So uh, cramps are very common at night, myself included. It's a common thing as we get older. Um, and um, Generally, a CalMag, which is the calcium magnesium together, um, will help with the cramps that you get at night. Um, magnesium on its own, um, unless you're deficient, probably doesn't have a, a dramatic benefit, but certainly from a cramping perspective, it does. The problem with magnesium, even if it could have some beneficial effects on muscle, is very practically it causes diarrhea. So, you know, you can only take like two or 300 milligrams before you're going to start getting diarrhea. Um, and that's why I like the calcium mag because calcium tends to make you more constipated. Magnesium makes uh, you more loose. You put them together. It's a nice combo. <laughs> All right. Uh, here's a question from someone who says, I'm worried about increasing protein or energy intake as this may make me gain weight. How can I determine how many kilocalories I should take in daily? Yeah, the uh, only really um, ideal way to know is to, um, you know, come into a university lab and they actually measure your total energy expenditure and stuff. You can uh, estimate, um, you know, there's ways you can look at how much time you spend sitting, how much time you spend doing activities as to, um, you know, what your energy expenditure is. We're getting better with things like wearables. Uh, so some of these smart watches and this thing on my hand here is called an Ura ring. So these things, uh, you know, can measure your total step count and stuff. So you can use some of these metrics to get a better understanding of what your total daily energy expenditure is. The important thing is 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram body mass per day. Um, if you were 70 kilos, let me just do the quick calculation, 84, uh, eight, uh, yeah, it's 320 calories. So um, 320 calories is not a lot. Even a sedentary person is probably going to be, you know, a, a female around 900 kilocalories to 1,000, a male around uh, 1,200 to 1,400. So 300 uh, calories uh, from protein is not a large amount. So the critical thing with nutrition is avoid crap. Um, you know, empty calories are so easy to consume. 
and many empty calories are empty for a reason. I mean, it's garbage, that's why they're called empty calories. So be very careful, read your food labels. And also um, specific to protein is the quality of the protein. So um, when I say 1.2, that is mixed protein, which is some vegetable sources, some meat sources, et cetera. If you wanna cut back on the calories, but get better quality protein, there's two main uh, high quality proteins. One's egg white, and the other is milk-based protein. Um, Mother Nature figured out those are the two highest quality, so they're most able to be converted into skeletal muscle. So you could probably get by with uh, 1.0 grams of protein per kilogram per day if it was mostly egg white or, um, uh, or milk-based protein. So that's a nice way of, uh, of getting uh, protein. And remember too that uh, protein is uh, four uh, kilocalories per gram metabolizable energy. So you can kind of do that calculation, which is what I just did in my head to come up with that 320 something. Great. Um, are there any trusted studies showing that taking a multivitamin has any measurable effect on health? Yeah, actually, there was a, um, a big uh, meta-analysis that just came out um, looking at multivitamin. Um, it was literally just two or three weeks ago. Um, so uh, with the multivitamins were of benefit um, in older adults. Um, the big thing is that remember that FSH dystrophy and our uh, patients are all completely different kettle of fish. We did the study first to show that people are not meeting even the basic recommended daily intake for these things. And so again, it comes down to replacement of deficiency. And part of the failure for some of the multivitamin studies is if you have someone who's completely able-bodied, who's eating tons of food, getting all their vitamins and minerals, of course, giving them more vitamins is, is garbage. Uh, but if you are deficient, makes sense to be on it. And we've shown in MD patients, most of them aren't even meeting the basic requirements. Then we went to step two, and that is let's stick a needle in them and measure if they're not getting enough, are they deficient? Folate, B12, vitamin D, uh, vitamin E as well. Um, you know, when we actually measured it, they were deficient. So my point is taking a balanced multivitamin, if anyone tries to say that that's going to cause any toxicity, their head's so far up their butt, they don't know what's going on. There's no way it's going to cause any toxicity. And for a group at risk, it's not an imprudent thing to be taking it. Mm -hmm. And then there's just the question, because with supplements and vitamins and so on, you know, there's some are maybe better than others. I mean, in general, when we talk about multivitamins, um, are general over-the-counter ones just as good as any specialty vitamins? Yeah, yeah. So uh, certainly as far as a multivitamin goes, I think, you know, you can't go wrong with any of the big guys, um, you know, the Centrums of the world, uh, Kirkland, you know, these uh, big companies, they have huge buying power. They cannot afford to misrepresent what's on the label. And certainly in Canada, it's a whole different kettle of fish. The requirements I have to you know, get this muscle five on the market, we did three randomized trials. There are drugs worth a million dollars per person per year that are being approved in Health Canada and FDA with one clinical trial. Uh, there are drug companies trying to push stuff out without even a randomized clinical trial. And yet for nutrition in Canada, we have what's called an NPN number. Um, so look for an NPN number on your products uh, if you're in Canada, because that means that you've gone through the regulatory process. But to get an NPN level three, I have to do more than if I was coming up with a new pharmaceutical where I only need one study, which is just, it, it's crazy. But nevertheless, uh, the US is moving in that direction. Uh, you know, we're very cognizant of the regulations that I've been pushing for for 20 years, uh, which Canada has now with the NPN, and the FDA is moving in that direction. So there are some, you know, pretty good uh, guidelines that are out there. Unfortunately, there's so much BS that's still out there. So look for when someone says it's clinically proven, but they don't actually have a link to the study or they don't show you the study, you know, it's garbage. And I can tell you, you know, most of the protein supplements and stuff that's out there, people just, you know, you can come out of grade 12, um, you know, stick a label on something, make some, some claims and put the stuff out there. Okay. So we have about five minutes left and a huge number of questions to try to get through. So I'll do my best here. Uh, we have a question from someone who is, a, if, you're a, if you have FSHD and you're a vegetarian, should they be taking creatine supplement? Oh yeah. So there've been many studies that have shown that if you're, uh, especially vegan uh, vegetarian, 
um, yeah, your levels are going to be low. Even a lacto ovo, uh, there's not a lot in milk and eggs. There's great protein, but not a lot of creatine. Uh, yeah, if I had FSH and I was a lacto ovo vegetarian or a vegan, you definitely should be on creatine because you're going to be severely creatine deficient. Um, you know, low hanging fruit. And they've been done studies too, showing that those are the people that get the biggest gains in muscle because you're deficient to begin with. And there was even a study on cognition showing that memory and cognition improved in vegan vegetarians when they took uh, creatine. So um, very, very safe. Um, stick with the low doses. Don't listen to anyone who's trying to tell you to load on 20 grams or garbage like that. Three grams for females, five for guys. You know, you don't need any more. There's no evidence to support much higher doses in this disorder or aging. Here's an exercise question. Is uh, eccentric exercise harmful, i.e. is it harmful to exercise to extremes to feel the burn? Easiest thing to remember is that if you cannot lift a weight 12 times, it's too heavy for you. So uh, the simple rule of thumb that we have in our clinic is you do three sets of 12 to 15 repetitions. If a weight is so heavy that you, know, you can only do two or three reps, um, then the weight's too heavy for you. And the theory behind this whole eccentric stuff is that you, know, you get these bodybuilders, they put a weight in the person's arm that is above the amount that they could lift once and you slowly let it lower. That's called an eccentric uh, uh, contraction. It causes more damage to muscle and for you know, an able-bodied person, there's some evidence you might get a little bit more hypertrophy, but it's way too risky from a, um, a joint perspective, way too risky from a muscle perspective. So we always stick with the lower intensity, higher reps and listen to your body. If you're really sore the next day, take an extra day off. Um, and start off really, really easy and ramp into it. We'll get into all of that in our um, YouTube videos that are coming out, but that's a great question. Okay. Um, have you seen any uh, things that boost mitochondrial function that are effective for fatigue? Well, the first thing for fatigue, I would say, is figure out why you have fatigue, because most of our mitochondrial patients don't have, quote unquote, fatigue. So they don't wake up trashed. They're not, you know, generally tired. They try to do something and then they get very rapid fatigue. So if that's the type of fatigue you're talking about, that's mitochondrial dysfunction versus if you are trashed and tired and sleepy, check sleep, number one, because poor sleep is the number one cause of generalized fatigue. Number two, check ferritin. So the number one cause of chronic fatigue, general uh, tiredness in middle-aged women is hypoferritinemia, meaning low iron stores, because iron is important for mitochondrial function. So you should check ferritin, replace ferritin to get those levels over 50. Uh, that's a recommendation. But check sleep, and that's the nice thing about these wearables. They do a great job of checking the quality of sleep. And there's all sorts of tips to improve quality of sleep that uh, we have and you know they have on the website for these things as well. Um, and then check for other things like do you have um, nocturnal hypoventilation and do you need BiPAP? Do you have obstructive sleep apnea and you need CPAP? Um, you know, do you have a, a deficiency? So check things like TSH, uh, check your B12, check your ferritin, um, males, check your testosterone, all of those treatable things, you know, look for, look for those. Okay. Um... Let's see, there's some questions about selenium, um, vitamin E together with selenium. Yeah, I think the bottom line is there's all sorts of, um, of hand-waving and extrapolations that people can make, but things need to be studied in the, the disease of interest or in humans together. So yes, selenium does have some evidence for um, antioxidant effects, but it can be toxic in higher doses. So there's you know, an issue there. I know it was part of the original study. Um, and so if you took that original French study that I showed you in 2015, you know, it, it did seem to improve function and it lowered one marker of oxidative stress. So it's not an imprudent combination. Um, certainly the, uh, the combination that we have has been shown in a human to actually lower oxidative stress. So, you know, we, we like that. Um, and it was based on uh, years and years of research and basic science work as well. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, vitamin E um, forms a nice redox couple with CoQ10 and with alpha lipoic acid, which is why it was there. Uh, selenomethionine, there may be uh, some you know, theoretical reasons why that might be beneficial from a methylation perspective. So, uh, but again, we want to study, that's one of the components that we want to throw in uh, to see whether it affects methylation. 
um, we just got to hopefully get the, the funding to do it. One thing you mentioned was about uh, looking at something, a supplement that can um, affect methylation of DNA. Obviously, that's you know, interesting for FSHD because of the hypomethylation of the D4Z4 repeat region. But is that something that actually is modifiable by diet? Yeah, I mean, uh, methylation status um, is uh, is definitely modifiable. I mean, people are trying to do all sorts of genetic um, things and using drugs and stuff to do it, but there are uh, exercise modifies it. We have a, a paper coming out on exercise and uh, DNA methylation, um, but nutrition is probably one of the most potent things that can affect methylation. For example, um, uh, gosh, group out of Sweden, the name of, uh, escapes me now, where they uh, just did one high fat um, diet, like uh, eating a, a Big Mac or something, and uh, it, it affected methylation of a number of different genes. So you can definitely hypo or hypermethylate genes. Um, nutrition is is a big way that uh, that we can we can methylate genes. I mean, methylation is a quick way to to alter how DNA is expressed um, uh, versus evolutionary means where you change the actual structure of the DNA. So it's it's very modifiable by environmental factors. Mm -hmm. But as of now, is there any evidence that it can do so in the context of, you know, the FSHD, you know, D4Z? I am okay. pretty convinced that we know exactly what needs to be done, but we just need to convince people to give us the money to do it. And then okay. hopefully I can talk to you in two years and we will prove what we think works. Okay, great. And the last question, I think, stay above nutrition. There's a person who said they've tried to order products, but they don't. They don't ship to the USA. <laughs> Can we? <laughs> is there a solution so, to that? Well, first and foremost, like uh, you know, my life is about helping people with muscle disease and mitochondrial disease, not about making money. If we make money, uh, it's going back into research and all sorts of crap, and you know, maybe pay off my mortgage. But um, so, as a consequence, for everybody on this. Um, if you are ordering in Canada, there is a code. It's called Neuro, N-E-U-R-O, Neuro20. Uh, so Neuro20. If you use that code, you get 20% off, which essentially means we lose money on our creatine product and we break even on the muscle product. So every patient that we see in the clinic to avoid conflict of interest, we give them this code and you guys can all have it too. Don't share it with the general population because we've got to try and make some money somehow. But anyone with MD, you're welcome to use that code. Um, and in the U.S., to answer your question, uh, we actually last week signed a deal with a third-party logistics group out of Utah to bring all of our products into the U.S. And hopefully that's, uh, we have to wait for the FDA regulatory approval because we're doing it all the right way, uh, which will be 30 days from now. And so we hope by the fall it's going to come out. Okay, well, we'll look forward to update on that. And uh, thank you so very much. We are...